Grace to you and peace from God, our Maker, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship at the East Craftsbury Presbyterian Church. Today, we, our sanctuary is graced with beautiful flowers again from Jane Marlin. Jane, thank you so much for sharing the bounty of your garden. Today, we will have some special music from pianist Bill Rogers, our friend and neighbor. And we are just so very grateful to be worshiping God freely and openly today. Today, we will again read from the book of Romans. And as we move through the service, I'd like you to think about how is it that the church community, our faith community, is different than other communities that you might be a part of. Maybe your school community, maybe you're part of a town committee or a town group or your group of friends, other other communities. What is distinctive about the church community or is there anything distinctive about our church community? And now, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us worship God. Let's join in our call to worship. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. By the mercy of God, let us present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is our spiritual worship. Let us not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The psalmist proclaims that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. God made us. God knows us. God knows everything about us. And still, God loves us. Confident of in this ever-gracious, never-failing love, Let us confess our sin. Let us pray together. And continuing together, forgiving God, we confess that we are conformed to this world. We conform to this world's frantic pace, too hectic to notice all the blessings you provide. We conform to this world's reckless waste, 
exploiting what you entrust to our care, we conform to this world's shallow values, oblivious to the giftedness of people different from us. We conform to this world's impatient attitudes, preferring the latest instead of the lasting. Forgive our conformity and transform us, O God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The psalmist asks the question, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, what would have happened? The answer is that we would still be lost in sin. But it is the Lord who is on our side, and so we are forgiven. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Friends, hear, receive, and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us pray. God of revelation, mere flesh and blood cannot reveal divine truth. Only your spirit can give that gift. Be in our ears and understanding that through these words, your word may be known. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. After many years, a new king comes to the Egyptian throne. Not knowing Joseph, he enslaves the children of Israel. I'm reading from Exodus chapter 1, starting at verse 8, going through chapter 2, ending at verse 10. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the, event, in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy kill him, but if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it 
and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because, she said, I drew him out of the water. And now a reading from the book of Psalms, Psalm 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away, the torrent would have gone over us, then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Thanks be to God. reading from the book of Romans. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, Paul tells the Christians in Rome. Put your life 
where your beliefs are. Now listen to what the Spirit says to the church. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So here we are again in the book of Romans. These first verses of chapter 12 mark a turning. Up to this point in this theological treatise, Paul has outlined and explained the story of the grace of God toward rebellious creatures. That would be you and me. This is a grace so determined, a grace so thorough, a grace so tenacious, as to not abandon those rebellious creatures to a lordship other than the lordship of Jesus Christ. This is because Jesus Christ is the only one who can reconcile those rebellious creatures with their creator to the end that they know what it is to be fully alive. Grace holds on to us until we are fully living under that lordship of Jesus Christ. It's tenacious. And up to this point, Paul has just been telling the story of that grace. And now, in chapter 12, Paul turns toward the practical effects of that grace. That grace holds us in God's loving embrace, no matter what, and then goes to work, shaping and reshaping us. This determined, tenacious, thorough grace not only brings creature and creator together, but this grace also inserts itself into our daily lives. With grace comes the power to reshape and restructure our lives in a way that is appropriate for life lived under the lordship of Jesus Christ rather than under the lordship of sin. Ah. Pretty heavy stuff for the first minutes of the sermon, Deb. Whatever happened to that opening joke? Well, you know I don't often subscribe to that. I usually try to get right to the point. All I'm saying is that Paul shifts his writing with today's verses in Romans from explaining what grace does to restore our relationship with God to tell us how it is that grace itself transforms us for faithful living. For Paul, the fundamental response to the grace given to us by God, beyond the response of gratitude, is to allow ourselves to be shaped and formed by the Lordship of Jesus Christ and for the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In other words, if Jesus Christ is Lord of my life and yours, then, well, then we would see evidence of it in our lives. It's not just an idea. It gets lived out daily. 
So in today's verses, Paul begins with the implications of how we live within Christian community. Next week, we'll explore the next section in which Paul uses 23 imperatives, 23, to guide us in how we live faithfully in this larger society. But for now, it's in-house. This is just for the community of faith. You and I live differently with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ because grace is at work in us and between us in our relationships with one another. Paul writes, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, and acceptable, and perfect. One commentator translates that verse this way. I find it very helpful. Do not let yourselves be shaped by what everyone else does, but rather let yourselves be transformed by a whole new way of thinking so you can discern what conforms to God's will, namely what is good and pleasing And perfect. Our guidelines for how to live life as Christians, our guidelines are not necessarily the same as those who do not profess Christ as Lord. Now, I know many of us don't see ourselves this way, but we're nonconformists. Sometimes that's easy to see, not conforming to the way the world does things. Because sometimes the culture pushes something really wacky that you and I know is not at the heart of who we are as human beings. Something that is not at all important and clearly not in keeping with God's will. Cheating on tax returns so that you can pay less tax and keep more money. Buying more than you need. Calling attention to yourself in order to boast about an accomplishment. All of these things, the larger culture encourages us to do. But that as followers of Jesus Christ, we know those things are wrong or simply not in keeping with who we are because we are followers of Jesus Christ. Our reading from Exodus is one of my favorites. Because we meet up with these two Hebrew midwives. Shipra and Pua. And they perform what we might call today civil disobedience. Or, in the words of John Lewis, good trouble. They were, in their own way, nonconformists. As Pharaoh's own form of birth control among the Hebrew slaves, the midwives were to kill the boys born to the Hebrews. And this is what the scriptures say. But the midwives feared God, and they did not do as the king commanded them, but they let the boys live. What a daring act of non-conformity. Seeing something wrong and doing something about it. You and I are nonconformists in our relationships with one another. As I said, Paul focuses these first verses in Romans chapter 12 toward our relationships within the church. While the culture encourages us toward pride and self-promotion, the culture encourages us to individualism, seeing my life as the defining factor in decision-making, The followers of Jesus are encouraged toward humility, not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. We are encouraged to set aside our own agendas in order to pursue what is best for the common good. And to recognize that the best way to function as a community is to honor all the gifts and skills because they are all necessary And no one person has them all. 
No spiritual gift or practical skill makes anyone, any Christian, superior to any other. All are needed. And so we find in communities of faith a great deal of tolerance and respect. We find people building up one another, encouraging one another. We find people who may actually not like each other working side by side to fill a need in the community. Well, of course we say, that's of course that's what we do. But don't underestimate just how non-conforming that is. There are a myriad of groups around. As you look closely, in many of those groups, the difficult person or the awkward person is shunned or somehow sidelined. Look carefully at all of those other communities in which you live your life. Is the church community any different than those other communities? Paul says it should be because of the grace given to us. Because this grace is shaping us and forming us in the ways of God's kingdom. We are in a terribly divisive time in our nation and in our community. Last weekend at the fire department picnic, I was talking with a few folks about the town's equity task force. And I asked what things other than race or race relations or racial justice, what other things might divide our community? Well, it didn't take long to come up with a pretty long list. From which general store you frequent to whether or not you wear a mask. To, a bit more historically, which home-based child care you went to. And the list of divisions went on and on. I don't even remember most of them. Many of them were not familiar to me because they were more in the past than in the present. We are in a divisive time in our nation and in our own community. And yet here, in Romans, Paul says that one of the marks that the grace of God is at work in the life of the church is unity. As you and I open ourselves and our church community to this transformative power of grace, Paul says that what we will display in our life together is unity. And in today's world, that's very non-conforming. It doesn't mean we don't have differences. It doesn't mean we don't have disagreements or difficult discussions. It does mean that we stay in these relationships with one another in a different way because we belong to God in Jesus Christ. It does mean that we are committed to listening to one another, to respecting one another, to learning from one another and growing together. Grace inserts itself into our life as a congregation. And grace is even now at work in you and in me and in our life together. So where do you see signs of that grace shaping our lives according to the ways of God? And where do you see more reshaping needs to happen? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Friends, the organ project nears completion. If you were to come into the sanctuary this week, you would hear Peter Walker and his assistants voicing the pipes Monday and Tuesday, and then hopefully the organ installation aspect of the project is complete. We are very grateful for Peter and for all who work with him, for his expertise, his patience, and his good work for us. Some of the final carpentry work upstairs in the classroom and in the office, the sapling's office up there, and in this new closet behind the choir loft will happen next month. Thank you to Jenny Stoner and Elsie Hurt and others who came in to clean on Saturday. The next round of cleaning will take place this coming Wednesday at 9.30 in the morning. If you would like to help, please let Jenny know. Remember that many hands make light work. We're trying to get the sanctuary cleaned up for a wedding next Saturday. Elsie Hurt's son, David, and his fiancée, Lindley, will be married here in the church with just very close friends and family in attendance. Next Wednesday is Marvin Rowell's 90th birthday, and we are planning a birthday parade to drive by his home that day. If you would like to join the fun, you can join in a couple of ways. First of all, send him a birthday card. And secondly, you can meet in the village of South Albany, which is really just the sharp bend in South Albany Road as it heads up toward Marvin and Georgette's. We're going to meet there around 2 o'clock, and we'll start the parade from there. I hope you can join us. I think it'll be great fun and a wonderful way to celebrate Marvin's 90th. Lori Mathis' father, John, continues in hospice and palliative care. We heard from Marianne and Kirian Weaver this week. They were on our weekly Zoom call. And they report that John Weaver's condition is about the same. I'm sure that you have other joys and concerns in your own life. We are grateful to God for all of the blessings and we lift to God all of our concerns. Let us join these all together in prayer. Let us pray. O God of all, thank you for hearing our prayers. For the human family with whom we share this world, for those closest to us, and for those whose names we will never know, we give you thanks. Help us to open to you, to your gift of life the way it can shape our lives toward conformity with your will, that we may treat all people with love and with equity. For the world we share with all of creation, the plants and animals we see each day, and the, the wider world that we've never seen, we give you thanks. We ask your help in living into our identity as stewards of the earth. We pray especially for an end to the wildfires ravaging the West. And we pray for people who continue to piece life together after storms. For local, national, and international leaders, those whose policies we appreciate and those with whom we struggle, we give you thanks. We ask you to be by their side to guide their words and actions toward justice and mercy for all citizens. For the joys and the concerns you lay upon our hearts, we give you thanks. We ask that you be by our side, guiding us to recognize that our help is in you. We lift to you those on our own prayer list, John and Mary Ann, Cassidy, Peter, Jeannie, Carol and John, Marvin and Georgette, Bob and Sandy, Nelson and Jan. Accept and heed all these prayers through Jesus Christ the Lord, who taught us when praying to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you go out into the world now, go out with joy and go out with courage. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed to live as the body of Christ in the world. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and those whom you love and those whom nobody but God loves this day and forevermore. Alleluia. Amen. Thank you.